Hello all, my name is Kyle. I'm one of the founders of Wake Up NZ and this is the first Wake Up NZ podcast. We are really excited to be exploding into this new form of media and we've got lots of exciting projects on the horizon. So stay tuned to hear more about those in the future. Last week I met Sam Mann, a respected New Zealand author, sculptor and freshwater activist at an Environment Canterbury Freshwater Rally. He's incredibly talented and a very funny man. I hope you enjoy this first podcast. Also, quick shout out to Genocide for letting us use their track Wake Up featuring deck collectors. You can find these guys on Facebook or download via iTunes. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. Yeah. You are not machine. So Sam, thank you very much for inviting me out here to this beautiful spot in North Canterbury. We've got the sun shining in, and what, what was the old building? An old flour mill. It's an old flour mill. It was an old flour mill, but now it's... Actually, when I first came here, um, I didn't tell you this before, but uh, when I walked through here, I came through here with a torch. Mm-hmm. I'd broken. I came in through one of the broken windows. You know, There's a song about that, mm-hmm. isn't there? Anyway, I think yep. like, you're, no, I don't know that you're one. too young. Too young. Um, Joe Cocker. Anyway, yep. I walked through here with the torch, and with the torch, I was able to isolate off all the bad stuff and just look at the good stuff, mm-hmm. which is what you should do in life, really. Isn't For it? sure. Take a torch. It's a good David Cagle. Yeah, yep. <laughs> David Cagle. <laughs> well, I walked through here, and I thought, God, this would make such a wonderful studio. Years later, a friend of mine was with me. We, we were making a foundry so we could cast our own bronze. And we did it in the engine room, which is all concrete. So then if the bronze blew up, the the bronze would just fly around the walls and wouldn't mm. set fire to the countryside. And mm. we were on a whole bunch of dairy farms. Which <laughs> we couldn't have that. No. <laughs> and he said to me, you know, this, this wasn't designed as an engine room. This was designed as a, as a foundry. Mm. A- and your main room wasn't for milling flour. It was made for making sculptures. Mm. A- and the barn on the end, that wasn't for storing wheat. That was for barn dancers. And mm. I realized the guys that built this building had me in mind. Of course they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. About 80 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So that's basically what it is. It's just a shell, really. Yep. We haven't um, cluttered the place by, mm. by making small rooms. We mm. freeze here in the winter and we burn mm. a forest. Oh, it's going to be pretty cold, yeah. Pretty cold. But part of the deal is um, when you live in a harsh environment, you, your wits are on, you know, at their sharpest. Mm. You find this in the mountains. Mm, for sure. People think most clearly. Mm. So I've never wanted to live in a petri dish. Interesting, yep. It's cool because you were saying that about the barn dances and how you get the community down here. and it's yeah, 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 the community was a lot richer when I first came here. We lived in, it really was a community. People cared about each other. Mm-hmm. And, and now, I think since Roger Douglas, since 1984, okay. we've become a country of individualists. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've lost our sense of um, social responsibility. For sure. So what happens now is we have barn dances, which farmers used to come to, but they don't now. They're busy talking to their accountants, Kyle. Yeah, funny that, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they wouldn't have anything to do with being a freshwater activist now, would it? No. Right. Oh, that's really cool. So um, it's not without irony that you live right in the middle of uh, North Canterbury dairy yeah. farming country. Well, I, speaking of irony, <laughs> um, you know, you often wonder why you get engaged in politics. Why mm. would you? Why would you? Mm. And And... I got engaged because when I first came here, I was living at the gates of paradise. Mm-hmm. There's Lake Sumner up the hill. There's this beautiful gorge, the Huronui River, this, this beautiful sinewy uh, piece of genius. Mm-hmm. You know, God was sitting there one day and thought, what can I, what can, you had time off. He said, what, mm-hmm. can I, what can I make now? You know, what can mm-hmm. I make which is really going to please me, mm-hmm. really? And there was the Huronui River. And when I found it, I thought this was the best. And when I wasn't painting, when the days were beautiful, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd leave my cottage and I'd drive my old motorbike down to the river and I'd spend the whole day fishing. But I wasn't mm. trying to catch fish, I was just there. Just I'd, enjoying it. I didn't realise what it was, but mm. it's just the ambience of the place. If anybody felt bad, all, if, all you've got to do is go to a river or to, mm. the, to, the, to the seashore mm. and everything gets washed away. I don't know what For it is. Sure. Yep. But the minute you go to a river and there's no water in it... Mm. Yeah, it's all polluted and you can't touch the rocks not. And well, one day our favourite river, mm. one that's only about a quarter of an hour from here, the, the river where all the kids used to go to play, disappeared. Mm. And we thought, God, what the hell's going on? So we got engaged. We went to the regional council and said, you know, um, this river's been taken. We'd like to have a return, please. Mm. Nothing happened. And after a long time of, of using due process, we decided to put a political party together, which is kind of weird. Mm-hmm. And we thought, well, we're going to have fun doing this. We're not going to yeah. turn out to be grumpy old politicians in grey suits. Yeah. 
And we promised ourselves that we would laugh the whole way through. And after nine months of it, we started to fight each other. Oh, really? And I thought, oh, this is so corrosive. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, after that, I thought, what's left? And what was left was um, using the only tools I had to fight these guys, and that's art. Mm. And so now most of my work has an environmental edge to it. Mm. Yeah, and you can definitely see that. So tell us a bit more about some of the early pieces that you did. Um, there was the, the John Key painting, which got a lot of um, media well, attention at the time. That, that, yeah, I was, going to get a bit, I was getting a bit desperate. Do you want me to kill that rooster, by the way? No, no, we can, that's it's actually adding to the ambience of the, oh, very the cool. room. We're enjoying that. Because we, we've just taken up archery. And, um, <laughs> it's not that I don't Your, your rooster or someone else's? Oh, so our, 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 what's my daughter's rooster. My daughter's rooster, right. We'll, we'll probably leave it then, eh? Oh, okay, right, yeah. Before it's just know. the wing feathers make great arrows, you know. So, ah, so, so which, which came first, the arrow or the chicken? Because I'm not sure. That's the, it's, the, it's the question of the day. That's the question of the day. Anyway, I think the first one I did, which I really liked, was a great big steel ball. It was two metres um, from one side of the ball to the other. Wow. What's that? Diameter? No, no. What, what do you call it when you measure a ball in width? Oh, um, circumference? No. No? Radius? I don't know. Something. Something. If you were to, if, <clears throat> yeah, if you were to poke it with mm. a stick, you'd need a two-meter stick to go from one end into the other. Wow, it's okay. a big piece. It's a big piece. Yeah. And the steel ball, it was all rusted steel. And just before an election, um, for four Sundays in a row, we'd put it on the back of my Morris Minor truck. Mm -hmm. And we drive down the motorway. <clears throat> what you had was this great big steel rusted ball with four wheels underneath, basically, because mm -hmm. it was so big you couldn't see the Mori Minor. Yep. We get down to Sumner, and there was a, that beautiful beach. And I'd park in the no parking zone because written on the side of the big steel ball was the word time bomb. Mm. And we had a clock set into it with the, with the hand uh, counting down the years before our rivers were buggered. And around the middle of the ball, I had etched a 24-verse poem about water. So the bomb was to attract attention, hmm. and once you came up to the bomb, uh, you'd read the poem, right? That was hmm. the idea. Sure. So we'd arrive there at the beach, and then I'd go over to a cafe where all the uh, middle-aged baby boomers had been out riding their bikes around the summit road in their lycra, and hmm. now had stopped to have uh, cappuccinos and hmm. um, hot chocolates with their girlfriends, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's happening all over this country now. I've no, noticed that the people who own everything are now yeah. in this, this great tsunami, <laughs> all these fuckers. <laughs> so... I'd, I'd, I'd go over to the, just a cold call. I'd go to them and just lean over the railing at, these, at, at the cafe. And you know, there's a certain <clears throat> moment when people know you're looking at them. It's mm. a social space. Mm. And they'd pause in their conversation, look up, and I'd be grinning down at them. And I'd say, God, you guys look so fit. And they'd sort of tuck their tummies in and say, Yeah, so we are fit. And the girlfriends go, Woo. <laughs> and I'd say, You know that ball over there? I put that on my Morris Minor by myself. Do you guys reckon you could help me get it down to the beach? And that's see, this is a challenge. I'm a little oh, thin, weedy artist, and they're yeah, yeah. You know, tough accountants. <laughs> I'm gonna spend this whole interview. This is of, good. Yeah, no, yeah. This is, you're like my mates. They give me so much shit. Right, 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 right. That's good. Yeah, but you've fallen off your horse on the, on right. the way on the way to the office. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Anyway, so this we'd get four of these guys, and I had handles on this, and we'd carry this ball down to the beach. And by the time we got there, they're all like staples, you know. Mm, that little absolutely buggered. <laughs> yeah, I said thank you very much, guys. I'd never get them to do it again because every Sunday would be a different crew. Yeah. We put this ball on the beach, and we've got the best gallery in the world because it's this great big empty space. Mm. And, of course, all the people on Sunday, they'd see this, and they'd all race over to it and photograph and it and read it. it. Yeah, yeah. it's great. There's one farmer, he photographed every verse and then texted it all through to his, his some mate somewhere. Mm. And got very angry. I had a couple of babysitters looking after it for the morning session. Mm. And he, he got stuck into them. They said, it's not our piece. It's that guy up there talking to Robin Jenkins. Now, mm. Robin's a tough guy, you know. Mm. And this farmer came up to me, and he was so angry. But what was great was we spent 20 minutes talking about our different points of view. And that's all I wanted was engagement. Wow. All I've ever wanted is engagement. And yeah. if art can, can do that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So every time, so that was, um, that was one of the first pieces that really had an effect. For sure. And then with Nick Smith, uh, we were just sitting here chatting one day, and someone said, do a portrait of him. I said, yeah. I said, what if I did it out of cow shit? Mm. And suddenly, that was that we made it out of cow shit, put it on Trade Me. I rang TV3 and said, hey, look, I've done the sculpture of the Minister of Environment and cow shit. Yeah. And within an hour, I had Radio New Zealand, two television stations, and the press wow. up here. Yep. Well, not an hour, in that morning. Yep. And the phone didn't stop ringing for two weeks, and I was wow. doing interviews. And one is just, that was a trick. I think if you can catch the public's sense of humor, even mm. the dark side will laugh. Mm. For sure. And then Nick Smith's PA gave me a ring and said, hey, <clears throat> do you want to meet with Nick? 
Mm. I said, sure. So we sat down at his mum's place and had lunch. His mother made the lunch, which was great. Mm-hmm. I wish my mother still made my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and we were supposed to talk. Of course we didn't because um, Nick spoke and I listened and, you know. What did he have to say? Uh, nothing really. We just, it was PR. It was PR, okay. But as I was leaving, mm. I said to him, Nick, I lied to him. I said, Nick, um, that sculpture I did of yours is just politics. I, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And he paused, and I could see him gathering himself. Um, and then he said, um, Sam, there's absolutely nothing you could do that could hurt my feelings. And at that point, I thought, ah, challenge that's a challenge. <laughs> so, so hence the new sculpture of Nick with his pants around his ankles. Yes. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it'll work. So tell us a bit more about that sculpture that you're working on at the moment. Is it three times the human size? Uh, that's what I wanted to do. But if it was three times human size, we, just, we wouldn't be able to get it on the trailer and oh, drive it on the road. Well, it wasn't that. It's just we'd break the limits. Um, oh, okay. I had no idea that three, three times is actually kind mm. of enormous. So yeah. I looked at the pieces at Te Papa. Mm. They are huge pieces, but they're 2.4 okay. times life size. So this one is 2.2. 2. Okay. It's manageable now. And I, can, I can get it on a trailer and drive it up to Wellington without getting pulled over. Awesome. Um, yeah. It's certainly going to turn a few heads when you've got that moving up. Well, hopefully, yeah. Well, I was going to get it on a. I try to make a turnable uh, dais for him to stand on, so that not only will his head turn, but his buttocks will as well. Oh, so okay. if you're following, you'd see the whole thing, you know, which would be great. But the trick is, um, if I do a cartoon of Nick, if I draw him, you know, looking stupid in a cartoon, it, it won't have an effect because that's what mm. people usually. That's what they expect. Oh, used to, yeah. Satirical cartoons. So that's why the idea is if the closer you get to reality, the more people are offended. Mm. Um, and that's the same when I, I did a painting of John Key mm. uh, lying dead in an alleyway. That was a few years ago. And it was part of an interactive video. So <clears throat> in that painting, if you took the cursor of your um, computer mm. and what you do, you, just, you press on some point in the painting, then a video would pop up mm-hmm. and... Um, you had to try and find out who it was who had killed him. John right? Key, that's why I remember this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I thought it was quite clever because um, the, the answer was our children, mm. that they will kill him virtually. That is like Muldoon. They will damn him mm. long after he's gone. Mm. That, was, that was the idea. Mm. The, it, well, yeah, we took, it up, we took the whole thing up to Wellington. We had a, um, up to a gallery up there. I had an evening. We got Lynn Freeman to come down. She was um, doing the Arts on Sunday program and... I got her as a mediator, and we wanted to talk about art as a political tool. Mm-hmm. And one of the people there said, look, by doing a painting like this, do you feel that you might be inciting you know, violence? And I'm thinking, Jesus, we signed up to the Iraq war, and mm. nobody said that was inciting no, violence. that was fine. No kind of. at all. But there's also um, there's, there's a lovely song by Bob Dylan <clears throat> um, called Masters of War. And the last verse, I don't know if you know it, but the last verse goes... He's talking about the masters of war and it's in the Vietnam time, right? He says, I hope you die and your death will come soon. I'll follow your casket on a pale afternoon and I'll watch while you're lowered into your deathbed and I'll stand over your grave till I'm sure that you're dead. Right. That's Bob Dylan. Yeah. Now, he got a Nobel Prize. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's, all, that's what I'm working for here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It'll follow. Yeah, I don't think it incites violence. All it's yeah. doing is... No, of course I agree. I mean, art is um, created to, you know... Well, discussion, debate. It was quite interesting because I shared the, um, there was an article about your latest piece and uh, one of the, I think it was stuff, and um, some of the com- comments on that were saying, um, oh, no, sorry, this was on just on their stuff website page, Facebook page, and there was people saying, this is disgusting, you know, this is so immature, I can't believe this is vile, you know, you can't do this sort of thing. And I said, I said, this is, this is art. I mean, the fact that it's got such a reaction out of you is exactly the point of it. Yeah. I mean, it's to create discussion, it's to create debate, it's to, you know, get people thinking. Yeah, yeah. And that's what your art pieces do. Well, they do. I think with the John Key one, um, the reactions to that, the first one, uh, were, were so powerful. We had about three or four death threats that came through. Wow. Um, how would that be from? Just well, I, in that first day, when it, first, it wasn't even up, and we got the death threats um, from people here and there. Uh, after that, we just got weeks of positive emails from all over the country, and we, mm. we, we almost made a family of new friends that mm. I'd never met before who were desperate, who couldn't say what they wanted to say, didn't know how to say it, so they were mm. saying thank you for saying it for us. Yeah. 
And the idea about, oh, what's that? That's cool. Beautiful. We've got a, a falcon that comes through from time to time. Oh, do you? Yeah. So you don't give it in Christchurch City? Not a lot, but that might have just been the Harrier. They had that funny call. Anyway, yeah. um, so for that first, that first couple of days, I was getting a bit nervous. Um, and I'm, I'm the most, um, <clears throat> what do you say, uh, I used to hunt. Um, I don't now. Uh, but I've never given away my guns, so we had two shotguns here <laughs> out of the cabinet, um, one upstairs, and Ellie had one downstairs. <clears throat> and at that point, I was thinking of sending her down to Geraldine, where we have very good friends. I just thought mm-hmm. I'd send her and Charlie down oh, there. Oh, wow, so you were actually quite concerned. I was, because I thought, you know, there's, there's nutters. And, mm. But I gave Nicky Hager a ring, and I said, mm. what do you do? Mm. He said, look, it's, there's a group of people whose job it is to derail you, Sam. For sure. And their job is to make jadabars and make you lose focus. Mm. That's what these emails are for. Mm. And what he was implying was that was these people are working for the National Party. Mm-hmm. He said when the Native Forest Action Groups were up and running on the West Coast, the same group, of, well, not the same group, but a group of people did the same thing. They were writing letters to the paper, mm-hmm. uh, pretending to be West Coasters, saying, look, this, this is going to destroy our, our, our livelihood and so forth. Um, and it's a strategy. So he says, what you do is you get someone you trust to look at your emails and to select what you should see and take the other ones away, otherwise you'll, you'll be distracted. That's mm. all it's for. And of course he was right, because mm. after that first little flurry, nothing else happened. No. It was fine. But that's the, dick, that's, that's the trick, not the dick, I didn't, mean, that, I didn't mean to bring Nick Smith back into this, but <clears throat> the, the, the trick here is, what is that thing they say? Uh, first they laugh at you, then they ignore you, then, then they, they fight, fight you, you, then you win. Then you win. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the winning part, but yeah. you've got to know that my dad once said to me, whatever you write to anybody, you've got to mean, because mm. sooner or later it will be used against you. For sure. So whenever I do anything, I think about it very, very caref- carefully. In fact, for that particular project, I went to three leading strategists, one in Auckland, one in Wellington, one down here. One of them said, don't do it. The other two said, do. So I went ahead. Mm. <clears throat> and every time I come up with an idea, we've got to do it. You can't be afraid. No, of course um, not. Because I think the whole country is afraid at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we need people willing to, you know, Speak out. I mean, like Mike Joy, what an absolute legend. What he's a legend been, because he's been putting his neck on the line <laughs> when uh, so many other scientists will, you know, they'll yeah. happily say what the science is, but they won't, you know, stand up and be counted. Well, how do you feel, Kyle? Because one day you may need to go and work for a firm someday and they'll look back. Someone did that. Meridian, uh, they, Meridian uh, were looking to get some work out of Boffer Miskell, uh, who are a consultancy firm. Um, but I'd written about one of their employees in a book I'd written. Mm. And this particular employee had done some great stuff for us. Um, I was in Spain. I got a call from my partner who said, hey, this friend of ours, she's really upset because she thinks she's going to lose her job. Mm. Because Meridian had said to Buffer School, and if this person, we don't want this person on this project. That's the best I can say without being defamatory here because okay. uh, or libelous. But that, that really pissed me off. Mm. And then recently it happened uh, a couple of weeks ago um, to well, one lady who was working in a big industrial thing near here was fired because she made a comment online about a video that I'd, in which I'd said a certain thing. She'd qualified it, made it more accurate. Mm. But the company she worked for said, hey, you've got a contract with us not to bring us into disrepute, so bang, you're gone. Wow. And that's it. So... Um, and I haven't heard it. I think that there's a deal has been done where she doesn't speak and about what's happened to her. Uh, but I mean, that's like limiting free speech. I of mean, course. We, we should never be worried about speaking our minds yeah. if it's going to impact our careers. I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty, pretty bad. Because even um, as, you, as people may pick up, you're giving a bit of shit about being an accountant back in the day. Um, even then, when I was in the accountant's office, I used to be, um, be told that I wasn't going to go far being an accountant. Uh, greenie in an accountant's office hmm. so I was sort of um, segregated from the rest of the office just based on political views mm-hmm. so it's not quite to the same degree but it's still to me it made me realize that this isn't the industry for me like it's I'm, I'm not a fit in here if, if my political views my world views are so different then it's it's never going to be an environment in which I'm really going to th- um, flourish mm-hmm. so that was pretty much the the turning point for me to say no it's time for me to do something different but you can still use those tools. Totally. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But it's it's so that's the 
And it's interesting, as an artist, um, I'm sure there's so many people out there who are artists, who want to be painters, who want to be writers, but unfortunately we live in a world where we need money to survive. I mean, <laughs> especially, you know, Generation Y now, it's yeah, so yeah. expensive, yeah. loaded with student debt, yeah. housing so unaffordable. If you live in Auckland, you know, I don't know what portion of your weekly income goes towards rent, mm. but I can imagine it's, you know, at least 50%. Yeah, getting close is, to two-thirds. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, this, that's the deal. I think that we have a responsibility. The people have taken everything from you. That's my generation. Because mm. we haven't left you a, a, a handhold on the cliff face. Mm. From, you know, I, one, once a year, I, I talk to Steiner, to the kids there, and the first thing I do is apologize mm. to them. Because but it's, 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 it's so sort hard. of tough. Like it's, uh, lately, there's been a, a lot of um, criticism of the baby boomer generation. But I think it's not really a generation's fault. I think it's more a government the government at the time's policies. I mean, yeah. they were... No, but we've allowed it to happen. I we guess did, it is to a point allowed, yeah. There's a, there's a lovely line in Carlo Gilbrand's The Prophet where he says, um, they say, speak to us of crime. And he says, if someone breaks into your house and takes something, you have to bear responsibility because you're part of the society that created need. Mm. And that's us. We've done that and we just let it happen. Why didn't we turn around when this, and, and put the right people into government? We're, mm. we're part of it. Yeah, no, certainly. And it's, it's a shame that, um, that more young people don't vote because, as I said, the government policy dictates the future of you know, this country and the young people are going to be the ones inheriting it. Well, I'm interested in that. Why do they think that they can't change the world? Because in 1974, uh, when the Truxton um, nuclear battleship came into Auckland Harbour, we had a submarine into Littleton, 2,000 students would be there, right? Hmm. Last time we put on a demonstration, we went to the university and put out 500 flyers. Not one student came. Wow. Now, part of the reason is they've got their heads down and they've got to get this stuff and get it done. Hmm. Two, when I go to the university, gee, I went to the art school recently and all the cars there were pretty expensive cars and they were serving uh, lattes. Hmm. Uh, we, didn't have, we had an old filter coffee machine, I think, with a high tide mark and periphyton <laughs> in it. <laughs> And something, something's changed. Uh, yeah. Art school, you know, if you go to art school now, how are you going to make a living? How are you going to pay off your debt when you get out of there? Because we could never sure. have done that. No. So a lot of the people at art school that I see now are quite wealthy people, and they know they're going to be fine. Mm. And to them, it's a bit of a game, I think. Where do you, where do you think that wealth's coming from? I mean, because art typically isn't really, you know, uh, something you do to, to make a lot of money unless no. you're successful down the track. But, yeah. I mean, those starting out, it's yeah. a lot of people are working jobs that they don't really enjoy just to make enough money to get by. Well, I always thought their parents were paying for them to go through. Mm. <laughs> When I looked around, but um, I think a lot of it would be student debt, though. I mean, really? if, you, if you ask around how many people have, um, you know, tens of thousands of oh, dollars yeah, yeah, of debt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when I left university, I was pretty lucky. I, I lived at home um, mm. for my first couple of years, and so I didn't get living costs or anything like that, and still had a part time job the way through. So I left with about 17,000 of student debt. Yeah, yeah. But I've heard stories of other people up to 50, 60. Yeah. I mean, if you're studying um, something like medicine, you're looking at 100 grand debt. Yeah. And then expected to try and get into the, the housing market and then, you know, told that oh, all you need to do is cut back on the iPhones and the lattes. And yeah, it's, it's and, a different, yeah. It's and a, the cutting back, those, those, those uh, recommendations on how to live come from us, my yeah. generation, people like, like fucking Joyce, who, yeah. who, who, who says, oh, you know, in this country, if all you could do is just put your head down, you can make it. And yeah. if you can't, well. Get stuffed. A horrible, horrible man. Mm. So where does it take us? Well, with. Um, with protest, um, I was talking with a guy called Greg McGee. Uh, he used to write for uh, television, mm -hmm. but he wrote a book called uh, Forskin's Lament years ago, which is a very powerful piece. Um, and he and I ended up in a green room once. We were, we were at the Readers and Writers uh, Festival. And just before we went on, I, I admired him very much. And so I was saying to him, since you write for television, what's your favorite television program? This is quite a few years ago. He said, Boston Legal. Well, that really stunned me because I thought Boston Legal was another American sitcom crap, a trivia program. Mm. So then I went back and looked at it, and we now have it on series. What uh, David Kelly, the writer, had done was he's trying to tell America where it was broken. Now, you can't say that to people flatly and straight to their face because they're, they're not interested. Mm. So he created a program full of sex, pretty people, uh, sexual tension, uh, lots of jokes. But of the four running, pro running stories in one program, there'll be one dealing with um, death row in Texas, the stop-loss program in, in uh, Iraq, um, 
the, the breaking of constitutional uh, rules and so forth. Um, they were very, very vital pieces in there. So what he'd done is he'd he'd got this razor blade and he'd covered it with chocolate mm. and he was cutting the Americans' throat with it. Well, he mm. wasn't. He was just waking them up. Mm. They didn't realise it. They thought they were being entertained. But mm. through it were, were coming all this important stuff. That's when I thought, shit, art can do this. Totally. So if I write a book now about environmental stuff, it's not going to be serious. It's no. going to be fun. So that, um, <clears throat> and it's totally, totally um, on point what you've just said. And I think um, for anyone who's read your letter to David Cagle, <laughs> which I thoroughly enjoyed myself, um, I, you had me laughing at numerous points during that. Oh, cool. And it's, it's exactly that point, the, the ability to use humour and wit to tackle a really serious issue is, you know, well, it's well, so important. Well, tell me this. I saw David Cagle recently. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how to get to him. Um, he, he's, he's very amenable. He talks to people. But this one, one particular time, I wasn't quite sure. So I waylaid him at ECAM between mm. meetings, and there he was. And um, I said, David, two questions. One, actually the first question is irrelevant, so I won't tell you what that was. But the second question, I said, second question, David. Um, how would you feel if I published our correspondence? Because we'd written, he replied to that letter. He mm. sent me a four-page oh, reply. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, I didn't know that. Well, I'll throw it up on the web, but it's a wee, wee bit dry, and he doesn't okay. really... Uh, attend to the main um, points, made. points made in there mm. that I, I thought were worthwhile. Mm. But um, I said, how do you feel about it? <clears throat> he said, I, he, he paused. He said, no, I think that's fine. I mean everything. You know, in my letter to you, I, that's, that's good. Uh, you can publish that letter. But he said, the comments you made about Margaret Baisley in there, is that they, those, those could be seen to be defamatory. I said, but David, I researched everything. Everything I've said in there is true. Mm. And he said, but Sam, truth isn't always a defense against defamation. <laughs> wow. Well, that just, I thought, <laughs> fuck you. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. is incredible. That's incredible. What a piece. So just a, a bit of background for those who don't know. David Cagle is a Environment Canterbury councillor who, um, so how it currently sits is we have, I think it's six um, democratically elected councillors and I think seven um, national government selected councillors and we only had um, democracy restored in October and it's only partial democracy. Uh, since 2010 it's been, uh, so pretty much national wasn't happy with how the councillors were approving um, water consents, those sort of things. So they removed all democracy under the guise of, oh, I'm not sure, using the earthquake it's sort of like... Um, you know, our governments do that. What's Naomi Klein's yeah, book yeah. about uh, shock, shock doctrine, shock, shock doctrine that sort of thing. And since then, yeah, it's we've only just got partial democracy restored seven years later, and still though they're refusing to give full democracy because they know that people aren't going to stand for, you know, the destruction of our environment, which mm -hmm. we're currently, you know, seeing through these councillors such as David Cagle. And we're lucky that um, we have councillors like Lan Farm, who is just absolutely incredible um, I've sat down and talked with her numerous times and she's really onto it she's a freshwater ecologist she's passionate about protecting our freshwater and um, she's really in there um, throwing a weight around and actually starting to shake things up and when you say throwing a weight around she's tiny she's tiny exactly <laughs> so I mean she's doing really really well but she's saying it's it's such a fight you know she's in there against these you know most of them are ex-farmers or still currently farmers um, and they're, you know, working on behalf of the industry. Of course, they're going to have a vested interest in protecting, you know, their investments. We had, so. we had a lovely time with Lange, uh, uh, an acquaintance or friend um, who's an artist, put on a an exhibition at Coca at the <clears throat> main, oh, yeah. main 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 sort of gallery in Christchurch. Mm. Um, and his uh, installation was a great big hot tub full of milk. Right? Yes, I saw images of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lan turned up and she was had to get into the milk. Yeah. Um, and you've got to imagine this. So it'd be up to their shoulders in milk. And she had with her, I think, a cook. Uh, I don't know who the other people were. Oh, one of them was uh, a, an organic dairy farmer, I think. Okay. So there were four people in this tub. No, Lan's the smallest one. She had to keep on swimming to keep her head above water. <laughs> And uh, it was interesting to watch her at work because there was no real formal structure. The idea was they'd all talk about milk, and we as an audience would stand around and listen. I don't know if it was, I think it was recorded. Mm. Um, but as most of these art installations happen in galleries, they tend to be an echo chamber. They don't really have an outside life, which is a shame. Mm. 
one of the reasons we stopped exhibiting galleries was for that. We want okay. our work to be seen by the public. Mm. But what struck me was that Lan quietly took charge of that pool and became the chairperson of it. She kind of ran it. She mm. had a very powerful voice. Mm. Um, powerful in so far as she's not loud, but mm. I noticed when someone tried to interrupt her, her voice just rose very, very slightly, mm. and quietly the other person submerged again, mm. not right under the milk. Mm. So that was her. Um, for our one, we had to get in. I had a friend of mine called David Round, who's a lecturer in, um, I think... He's a law lecturer. Isn't he's a law lecturer. Yeah, I had him in because um, I did first year law. I think he's oh, one of my lectures. He's at one so point. funny. He's a hilarious bloke. Well, yeah. I said to him once, um, David, I, I've got a friend who's who you're teaching at the moment, um, a, a girl called uh, Catherine or something. And he said, I have many Catherines come to my class. Um, I said, Yes, she's very skinny. Oh, she was so skinny. She swallowed a grape, and two boys left her. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a very funny guy, and um, so I said to him, look, I can't stand sitting in a pool of milk um, trying to be uh, erudite. It's not going to work. Yeah. David, could you come along and give a legal point of view? <clears throat> so he did. Both of us hired some 1930s uh, swimming costumes because mm. you know, both of us are getting pretty old now. Yeah. <laughs> so he turns up. So we jump in this pool, and it was quite cool. We had um, a friend, somebody there who was a chef. There was mm. him, there was me, and there was... A guy from the business table think tank, okay. business round table think tank, National Party think tank, uh, and he's an, an economist, <clears throat> and he comes from Canada, I think, or somewhere weird. I should like Canada very much. And we started talking, and he was so sure of the, the free market's right to water and how it would, in the end, benefit everybody, you know. Wow. And I saw um, David Round slowly sinking in the, in the milk. He was becoming so angry, mm. and he, he slowly submerged and submerged until his beard was just <laughs> slowly, the milk was running up the tendrils of his beard. He was about to blow bubbles, and he had this, he was eyeing this man, and he just slowly got stuck into him. It was so I good. But meantime, under the milk, of course, his feet were, were were going all over the place, and yeah. <clears throat> he had to get his big toe out of my crutch at one stage. <laughs> but afterwards, he said, "Thank God you were there, Sam. Otherwise, I would have drowned that little bastard." <laughs> um, but it's, it's quite a good thing. That was Land. So Land's, you know, she's very, very good. The thing that struck me about that as a water protest or as a as a, as a dialogue, we didn't get the dairy farmers there, mm. and you can't get them to engage. It's no. very, very hard. No. And on the Land of Water Forum, you know, when Mike was talking about that, the only people really left in it are the farming lobby, and that's mm. it. Mm. And he said, you know, when Nick came out with his plan for, for clean water, he said you didn't hear a murmur from them. In other no. words, they're happy. Of course they're, they're happy. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. they don't have to change anything. Yeah. It's pretty much business as usual, plus now they can double the allowed <laughs> amount of pollution in the water. I just give this one thing from, from Mike, which now I remember it. Um, I did an interview with Mike in a cafe, now, you've done interviews everywhere. A cafe is the wrong place to do interviews. Do not do an interview. Do an interview, cafe. yeah. yeah. No. We, we found the quietest place. All the smokers yeah. are out there. You know? yeah. But still, the sound of the knives and forks in the distance, no. your ears uh, can focus, yeah. but the microphone can't, right? No. Yeah. So it was a bad interview. But at one point, at the end of the interview, I said to Mike, are you an optimist? <clears throat> are you an optimist? He laughed at me. He said, oh, you're one of those people. You're one of those people who think the glass is either half full or half empty. Sam, you've got to remember the glass was once full. Mm. In other words, every time you make a compromise with a farmer, they get half of what they want, mm. and we give away half of what we want to keep. Mm. The next time you do a compromise, they it's get half quarter. of what, and so it goes. Yeah. Until in the end, we've got nothing. So we, we can't compromise anymore. No. Jen, Jen Toop from Greenpeace mm. was asked to talk with Fonterra. She said, no, get stuffed. We've done enough talking. You know, it's it's, it's lock, for, lock and load now. It's time yeah. for action. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing is um, like the word sustainability. We can't just sustain it now. Like we can't just live our life based on sustainability. We need okay. to completely rethink how everything's been done because sustainability is down a path of destruction. Oh, we, wait, wait, we I haven't thought about this. So that's sustainability, if we sustain what we've got at the moment, we're mm. stuffed because what we've got at the moment is not enough. Yeah, well, that's it's, it's exactly it. Like, if you think about the time bomb, which is the nitrates and that, which is leaking down into our waterways and that, mm. there could be a 30-year delay. I, was, mm. um, I heard from, I was talking to my friend Bryce. Um, he, he was um, talking to a land soil scientist, and she was saying that it could be at least 30 years until all the... Um, right. 
dairy farming impacts that we've got now starts getting realised in our environment. So there could be a, a delay. And what we're seeing at the moment is only from the past mm. decades. Like mm. we, we could still have a, an absolute monumentous um, environmental disaster on our hands. And Nick and Cagle will be dead and our children will be cleaning up this mess. Exactly. And the weird thing is it's happened all over the world already. Mm. Denmark was the, the best example. Same population, same intensification. 30 years ago, lost all their rivers. Then they lost their seaboard. These fishermen were pulling up crayfish pots with rotten crayfish in them. Mm. And then the people, seeing all the rotting weed on the seafront, mm. turned around and said, we've had enough. Mm. The government then pulled back and they said to the dairy farmers, you may farm, but your consent is renewable every year, mm. not every 30 years. And the industry shrunk, and they found other ways of making a living. They did mm. very well. Mm. They produced the best television programs in the world <laughs> at the moment. But that was incredible. And so we say to these guys like Kegel, it's happened before. It's, no, 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 we're better than that. We no. are cleverer than that. No. It's just all a lie. So what's, what's the point in which people start to change? What's the point at which people start holding? When they get hurt. Now, this is the thing. Mm. Um, and I said this to Mike the other day. Um, will this cyanobacteria and the degradation of the water kills somebody. He says, yes, it will. Mm. Well, that's already happened in Havelock North, isn't it? Didn't a right, couple yeah. of people die from... Whether, it was, whether they were already ill on that, yeah. pushed, I don't know, but Mike said that some of the effects of the Campylobacter will stay for them for, forever. Well, there's people that had some... What's, there's like a, um, some sort of brain disease or something, isn't it, that is specific to the poisoning from there. There's some people that are now... They all suffer the rest of their lives yeah, with that's this right. disease. But I don't know how that's going to be spun by the government now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, like, you know how Nick Smith says, oh, oh the nitrate in the water is coming from birds. <laughs> Which it's not. I don't know what planet he's on. That's well, it's, it's amazing, right. Isn't the, it? the nitrate's coming from the red herrings. Yeah. We all know that. Of course we do. Anyone that's got any common sense can see where the nitrates are coming from. So, when, when again, when people, I heard that um, Hackwell from Forest and Bird, he's just left the water forum. But he seems so apologetic and tiptoeing. Every interview he's on, he's going, well, well, you know, if they want to um, take some of our recommendations, we'll come back. What a fool. Wow. Every time people do that, they dither around. It's like Berlin in 1938. There were mm. people going, oh, no, these guys aren't really bad. Not going to do that, yeah. yeah. I, I just read The uh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. It's quite interesting. What struck me was I thought a small number of bastards had got hold of a whole population and made them do what they were doing. But mm. Tolstoy, I think it was him who said that when the government becomes a bully, the people become a bully. Mm. And it infected everybody. And in this oh. country, I think it's happening here too. If you just look at the, yeah, the population here, it's, it resembles a lot of the attitude that our government's got. Yeah, and exactly. how, how do, you, do you think that's an impact from the media? How do, you, how do you think that's impacting people? I don't know. I mean, how do people like Hoskins um, arrive on our television sets every night? He'd be laughed, mm. laughed out of the room back in when my, when my father's generation would have True. put up with that kind of crap, mm. you know. I guess, and that's the, the thing with the generation divide now, is a lot of young people aren't watching television. Yeah, like uh, I don't know many of my friends who would sit down and you know mm. flick on the telly at night. I mean, everyone's watching okay. shows on demand like Netflix or. Okay, but explain this to me then. Um, if you're not watching, when you watch, when we had one channel way back when I was a cad, <laughs> yeah, one channel and this wind up television had rubber bands, and when you watched that one program, the news program, then you went off and you discussed it with people because you'd all seen the same thing. Mm. So then you could take it apart, and it had to be pretty good because there's a lot of you know. Um, aggressive debating around you know, what you've just seen. Mm. Um, now, when there's just cooking shows on and The Bachelor or whatever, mm. no one wants to watch it who's got an IQ more than 12. Mm. So they go to the web to find something there. Mm. But everybody's going to a different place. They're going to the place of the most comfort for their intellect or, mm. or their interests. So everybody's looking at something else. Am I mm. wrong about that? No, no, you're, you're 100%. And I think that reflects our society because people really just want to be distracted. Okay. So, I mean, that's why this sort of brain-numbing television is so popular. It's because people are living with such stress in their lives and jobs that, you know, are just so overwhelming <coughs> that they want to come home and not have to think about that. They, okay. can, they want to come home and completely switch off. Okay, so it raises the question, how do you touch everybody? Mm. And the way you do it is with an earthquake. Everybody's touched, no matter what program they're watching. Mm. If children, people's children, because people care about... Uh, whether they can pay the rent or, mm. or, or, or pay the rates or fix the roof, mm. and the children's health. Mm. If a child gets sick and two children get sick, 
Have you remember Ali Guthrie in Alice's Restaurant? No. <laughs> before me <laughs> okay uh well okay i was still writing protest songs but he wrote this beautiful beautiful piece alice's restaurant as a song goes on for eight minutes it's mm. fantastic uh but one part he's talking about how um to avoid the draft in america he says well you go you go into you go in to see the psychiatrist and uh you say to the psychiatrist i want to kill i want to kill i want to see blood i want to see veins in my teeth and you're both jumping up and down saying you're my boy <laughs> but he said if you walk in there and you sing one chorus, one, one verse of Alice's Restaurant, and you have to look this up, by the way. Okay, All you guys will. have to look it up. I will, for sure. He said, they'll think that you're, you're crazy and they won't take you. If two of you go in, he says, they'll think you're faggots and they won't take either of you. This is, I'm talking about 1968 here. Sure. If three of you go in there, they'll think it's a movement. And... Guys, he said, people, he says, imagine all of us going to the draft office and we sing one verse of Alice's Restaurant and the war will be over by tomorrow. And <laughs> so what I want is I want everybody... To just, you know, at ECAN, if yeah. if a hundred of us turned up at ECAN with a sugar sack full of weed, paraphyton, and cyanobacteria from the Heronui River, or your yeah. favorite river, you walk yeah. in there, Clean you dump it on the ground, you say, this is your problem, you made it, you deal you with deal it, with we it. just cleaned up the river for you. We'd get rid of them. They wouldn't, we would. they'd go. All we need is a bunch of people. When we went to the TPPA march up in Wellington, yeah. there was, I don't know, it looked like 8,000 people, just mm. the... The sea of people. A sea of people. And yeah. we went up. There was a barricade around the parliament building because they normally get fingerprints on it from all these <laughs> the dirty, unwashed people. Dirty at least. Yeah. Yeah. So after the speeches, everybody's standing around, and there were five security guards with their great big vis, high vis vests on. This, security guards don't come over these fences. And everybody just quietly climbed over the fence. There's nothing they could do about it. Not that and many people. That's the thing. So people have to know that. They actually have got strength, and sure. the, the wisdom of the crowd will prevail. And mm -hmm. eventually, I mean, we could have walked into Ecan the other day if there'd be two hundred people, and mm -hmm. if it was my one, I said, "Come on, let's go in. Yeah. We'll just walk into David Cagle's office, pick up his desk, his computer, his books, take him outside, and, him and drag him out. <laughs> no, don't have to. Don't have to take him out. Yeah. Just excuse me, David, and just yeah. take his stuff out and clear his office. Yeah. I think he'd go home and and, and go to Accra and read a book because. I mean, at his age, why yeah. would he be bothered? Dealing with that, yeah. 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 No, people do need to realise that, that we have the power in numbers, and I guess that's what we're told, is that we're weak, you know? We're, yeah. we're constantly reminded that we don't have that strength <laughs> because what's a bigger threat to the system than people who are standing up? Uh, I think Michael Moore said, in America, the people are afraid of government. In France, the government's afraid of the people, mm. until recently, mm. because the people once took the government and chopped their heads off, right? Exactly. Well, you know, the royal family. Yeah. Um, I read a lovely book um, called, oh, what was it called? The Wild Places. It was a, a, a bloke who had written a book about England and or Britain and all the places which were still very close to being wild. They were the places where you'd probably like to live. Mm, for sure. The wind blew, there was nobody around, there was rocks. You know. He visited these places and he, he came to a village which was right on the edge of a moor and the moor was owned by some wealthy um, laird or something. And one, this is way back in the 1800s, and one day this guy had said, no, he wants to close the moor for hunting for his mates. So he didn't want the village people on the moor to disturb the pheasants. Now, in most countries in Europe, there's a freedom to roam. Uh, in this country, weirdly, there's not. But mm. one guy in that village called Benny Rotham, I think that's his name, I was impressed by this. He got all the villagers together, and he said, on Sunday we shall walk the moor, and the whole village walked the moor, and from that moment on, there's nothing the laird could do mm. because there's so many of them. Now, here, uh, just up the road from us, there's a lake that nobody can get to because it belongs to us, but the landowner won't well, allow it. Yeah. Restrict access. Isn't that an issue in New Zealand at the moment? It's a huge issue. But yeah. all you need to do is you just choose key points and you get 500 people there, have mm. a lovely picnic, and you walk it. Mm. There's nothing they can do about it. No. Nothing. No. And that's exactly... Have you seen the movie um, V for Vendetta? I want to. It's a very, very, and it's pretty much touching on exactly this this okay. point of that how much power we all have. Because if we all marched on Parliament and demanded change, we there'd be it. there'd be no no other option. So what we if have we, to do? If we marched there with a hundred thousand people, yeah, it's, it's done. It's, it's done. It's done. But how do you get people to do it now? Yeah, you've got to you got to get. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to mobilise. We're trying to get people at protests. We're trying to get people yeah. involved in politics and discussing these really key issues in New Zealand. And so, you know, this is like social media has created such an awesome avenue for people to be able to engage. And, but it's, it's still, 
it's very easy to sit behind a keyboard and you know share views but to get out of the you know the comfort of your home and you know to stand up for something you really believe in is probably the most powerful thing that we could do at the moment to, to create change and so it's just trying to really encourage people and show people that we do have the power if we want to use it we can really create change whether it be i mean voting is very limited in how much we can change but at least that is still using some of your power but for us to really mobilise, get out there, get these issues. Because, I mean, even that small um, small ECAN protest last week, which is where I met you, mm. um, and you gave an amazing speech, by the way. That was, <laughs> it was absolutely hilarious. Thank you, Rich. It was good. Um, even that made uh, headlines around New Zealand. It's just, you know, small... And that was, what, yeah. maybe 200 people on a cold Canterbury day. Mm. Um, imagine if, you know, all, all the TPPA protests, that was massive mm. media around mm. New Zealand. And so we've got to show people that this is how we do it. Just keep hitting these issues, keep getting active, get out there, get involved, start picketing, you know? I think we've had a really bad time with that earthquake. Uh, it was very, t very uh, unfortunately timed just before the earthquake. We were so angry. We had a meeting at the Great Hall in Christchurch and asked people to bring ideas of how to create change. And we mm. said, look, don't just bring the ideas, bring the mechanism with which those ideas can be put into practice. Mm. Not only that, you have to be the point person for that action. Mm. So that meant you couldn't just come up and spout off. Well, we had 300 people in the hall, which is all it could take, and we had some bloody good ideas. Uh, among them, uh, I had three. The first one was to build a cairn in Cathedral Square. So that became my project, I guess, and we got a good group around us, and everybody worked together. It was wonderful. Mm. And at that, I said, there will be no placards, and there will be no loudspeakers. People will just come. We want ordinary people there, so it can't be seen as a cliché. Mm. When you have placards... I mean, Billy Connolly has done a great spiel on this. You know, he says, God, you guys, what do we want? When do we want it? You know, it's just crap, right? Don't do that. Every time you do a protest, it has to be different. Mm. So for that one, it was good. It was quiet. It was orderly. And in the end, we gave everybody a gift. We had five trailer loads of boulders. And after we'd had um, all the presentations, not made by politicians, but by a farmer, mm. a, a climber, uh, uh, Lydia Brady, who's wonderful, a poet, uh, Brian Turner, came up for it. Um, Robin Judkins, of course, he came up. Robin was great. He'd had his leg broken. He was in crutches, and he was in a mood, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and Robin was sitting there, was furious, and, and he got, went up to stand on the dais to give his talk. And I said, do you want a hand? He said, fuck off. He, said, <laughs> and he climbs up on the dais with his sticks, and he got up to the microphone, and he threw his crutches on the ground, and he says, I'm fucking angry. He says, and his, the main thing about that protest was Robin, good old Robin, he said, if you give any kind of protest sound is the first ingredient. It has to be perfect. Mm. So he gave us $1,000, and for an hour we had the best sound in Christchurch. These wow. stacks of stuff. These guys came to it, and you could hear every syllable in every corner of the square. Whenever you have a rally, I'm just saying this, mm. sound is the most important thing, totally. you guys. Totally. Uh, it's no good if you can't hear what the people are saying. right? So that was it. At the very end of that, Ariana Tikal, who was a friend of ours, was singing a lovely waiata for, um, as people came, we had, tr we had five trailer loads of boulders from the Waimaka River, and we asked people to take a boulder each to build this can. So we'd, mm. we made the cage for it, mm. and, and they all, clutching a boulder each, put it into the can, and yeah. you can hear this clattering of stones. Mm. We did a YouTube of it, it's really great. Mm. And... We built that cairn on council land without a permit. Mm. It's three tons of stones. Mm. It's still there. It's still there years. right next to the cathedral, isn't now, it? Now, that's an example of a mass of people being able to do something. And the council, Bob Parker, the bastard, he is such a bastard. Anyway, mm. he I don't know what I can say about Bob right now that would actually rid him from my soul. But anyway, <laughs> at one point he wanted to shift it. And we just sent a small delegation and said, look, if you want 3,000 people in this council... He said, no, no, it's okay, fine, we'll leave it. <laughs> and it'll, it'll be there until, until our democracy fully, is fully restored. So awesome. that was the power of a group of people totally. doing something. Mm. So it's possible, guys. And, it's, and, I mean, being where it is, I mean, that's probably like the tourist central spot which everyone's coming. Because if you go there, everyone's looking at that, reading yeah. that, and all the messages and that on it. What a powerful piece of protest. Well, that was the first one. The second one was going to be a concert for democracy. I spoke with Anne Herkus, a Labour Party, uh, and she's a great fundraiser and clever mind. Mm. I said, look, how much does it cost to hire the town hall? In those days, $3,000 for a community event. So, right, we'll have a concert for democracy. We had a list of 20 people who would perform one piece each, one light, one microphone, big stage, um, 
three thousand people. Yep. Yeah. Um, paying something like fifteen twenty dollars each to come to this concert. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd have humor, have some poetry, mm-hmm. have some skits. But basically, people would give their time for free. Mm-hmm. It'd be like the concert for Amnesty International. You know, mm-hmm. we, and we had this whole thing planned out. It was going to be great. And out of that, we could make thirty thousand dollars bang as a fighting fund. Mm-hmm. With that money, we could then do mail outs with you know gorgeous colored photographs of, of what was going on. We could we could do stuff we couldn't do. Um, a little more easy. And then the earthquake came along, bang, it was gone. Mm-hmm. We're now at a point we could do it again. We've got to get the same kind of venue back again. But mm. again, we've been talking about this concert for democracy and to have it every year mm. and just put that into a, into a fighting fund so sure. we can just touch those people who, who, who don't know that their property, their mm. fucking property has been taken off them mm. and given to corporates mm. in the name of the public good. Mm. Anyway. Powerful. Well, yeah. let us know when you do get, get out of the way because we'll certainly help out with that. Well, can you imagine it? There's yeah. so many guys out there with talent. Oh, it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? And there's people. so many, yeah, so many conscious people. So tell us a bit um, about the. So you did the statue, or the was it the bust of Kathy? How do you pronounce your last yeah, name? Yeah, Kathy Centenni. 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 Yeah. So tell us a bit about that, because that yeah. was a very powerful piece of protest as well, and I well, think it was, they had well, a, a ton of support. Well, Kathy um, played fiddle here for twenty years. Uh, every year we had a barn dance, and she'd come up from Geraldine. And as their rivers declined at the same time as ours declined, we mm. got our friendship wasn't then built just on, on music. Uh, we, we became engaged, her and her husband and that whole group down there were fighting very hard for their rivers, so were we. Mm. So we got to um, engage on that level. And Kathy gave everything. You know, she was a great climber, mountaineer. She'd come here from England, she loved this place and um, brought up her children at the foot of a mountain in a little cottage uh, with a beautiful stream. Mm. And when that started to go away, she got really pissed off and did what we did, mm. started to petition the ECAN. Mm. She'd come back from a trip in the mountains a day early so she could write a submission. And the thing that struck me was the day that she went to see Cagle and she said she had a meeting with him and she said, look, for 15 years we've been engaging in good faith with the farmers and with you, trying to find um, a compromise that we can live with. But every promise made to us in 15 years has been broken, right? Mm. And Cagle said to her, that may well be so, but we didn't break the law. Now, and this was on the plaque. This was on, on the plaque. The, yes. So I cast her head. She died two years ago. A wonderful, beautiful lady. Mm. Um, when she was going to go through her chemotherapy, you know, for, for 10 years I'd been asking her, would you just sit for me for a portrait? It'd be great. And she said, no, no, no. She's very um, self-effacing. Um, but she knew she was going to go through chemotherapy. It's going to be tough. So I said, well, "How about now?" She said, "Yeah." So I took about twelve photographs of her from different angles and created a sculpture mm. of her with a beautiful plait of hair she she always wore. Mm. Um, and so when I had a cast, uh, yeah, I, we took it to Ecan and we had it on a plinth. It was a five hundred kilogram concrete plinth, which was a culvert, mm. an old culvert, and so bronze haired plinth. And I thought, "Shit, how are we going to get that?" onto the ECAN property speedily. Mm. So I figured out with my rudimentary mass it would take eight people to lift it without getting hernias. Yep. Um, and I then contacted certain media people and said, what's a good time? They said, eight in the morning. That means you can get morning report and uh, the press and do it at the beginning of the week mm. when, when... Everything's uh, fresh. Yeah, yep. that's right. So I don't know this stuff, Kyle. I need to be taught how to like in social media, the same thing. I need, I need to know these things. So you go to the people who do it best and ask them. So we thought, right. So at about quarter to eight, I'm circling ECAN with my car and trailer. And on the trailer, I've got this 500 kilogram piece. And my partner, Ellie, is on the forecourt waiting until she, we had eight people there mm. who looked tough. And the minute we did, she gave me the thumbs up. And so I just drove straight up the ramp and parked mm. right outside the front door of ECAN. A little lady came out, strutting out, you know, like a, a bantam rooster. <laughs> oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> you can't park here, you know. I said, well, but only be a moment. I'm delivering a sculpture for David Cagle. He knows all about it. <laughs> oh, so out comes the cell phone, off she goes. And within about 30 seconds, oh, not 30 seconds, we had to untie it, but with yeah. a very short time, bang, we had that sculpture in place. Outside Ekin, on a piece of land we knew didn't belong to them, mm. because their land is where the building is in about three meters out, but the rest of it was owned by Lynn's Land Information wow. New Zealand. So we had this information that if we put it there, they couldn't remove it, mm. not without Lynn's permission. Mm. So then the, the CEO, Bill Bayfield, came out, and Bill Bayfield's a bit of a, um, 
I don't know how to describe him, except he came from Taranaki, where they're doing, <laughs> doing a lot of fracking. And that kind of proves a lie. You know, Frost and Bird said that the fracking in Taranaki would kill all the invertebrates, but Bill Bayfield's alive. So anyway, <laughs> I didn't get that joke out the other day. Actually. I was going to... <laughs> That's a good one. So Bill came and he was kind of pissed off to begin with. And then he's a very sharp guy. He realized, uh-oh, we can't actually touch this. I got my car out of the way then. That was fine. Mm. But within three minutes, the police had arrived. And, no. and the police were cool too. They looked at us. We're all sort of old farts. And there's John Minto. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck John Minto. He's going to beat the shit out of us. <laughs> and we had two politicians there and a few other things. So they'd probably sized it up. And they sent a young woman police officer. She must have been in her early 20s. Over to talk to me. Okay, mm. very good strategy, right? Mm. And um, we wandered off. And I just said to this guy, hey, you know, um, to the older policeman, do you have kids? Um, these guys, do you know what they're doing? And they were so interested to know what the problem was. It was mm. cool. They were mm. very, very nice. Mm. And I, I meant to say, I think, at some point, I said, Look, these guys, good on you. you. You, the police, are tidying up the tattered ends of a society which has been torn apart by this government. And that's the dirty work they have to do, For even sure. coming to stuff like this. Every day, that's their job. Yeah. Yeah. And I th it's, it's, it's a horrible thing. Anyway, mm. they were great. Um, my daughter, she was a bit nervous because she saw her father walking off with the policeman, you know, oh, and she still believes there are frames and yeah. you're not allowed to break them. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll teach you that you can. Yeah. But anyway, that's a, that was the thing about having Kathy there was she was a real person. She had, she had engaged with ECAN, they'd let her down, and there she was, and it was called Vigil, this mm. thing. So my view was we're going to leave her there uh, until ECAN democracy is restored. Now, I spoke to um, who, Vicky Buck at the council, deputy mayor, and mm -hmm. said, how would you feel if it's stayed? She said, great, we'd She's be awesome, happy. She's awesome, Vicky. Yeah. She's really cool. She said, leave it. And then she did some research and came back to me and said, look, unfortunately, the, the council have sold that land to ECAN, I mean, to uh, Linz. Mm. So we can't do anything about leaving it there, but it's up to Linz. Mm. Bill Bayfield, he talked to Linz and said, um, can you remove it? And they did, but they were very good and they were very careful with it. Because mm. I said to Bill, I can't remove it because that would be like taking Kathy's voice away. He said, you can leave the sculpture but take the plaque away. I can't do that because that's her voice. You know? mm. So in the end we took it. But it made its point. It doesn't mm. matter. Banksy, look at him. He puts mm. the piece up. Mm. It might be there for three minutes, but it's mm. photographed. Yep, and that's it. That's all you need. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So what, what was the main issue? Was it the because I, I read up on some of the correspondence from David Cagle about the plaque. Yeah, that seemed to be the main issue. Was it? Was it the? It was the main issue. He said uh, when I asked him about it, he said um, that was one piece out of a, a long conversation with Kathy, and you're taking it out of a context, and therefore that's what makes me feel unhappy about it. So when I saw him and asked him <clears throat> how he felt about our conversation that I, he and I had had, and he said yes, you can publish it. Great. Because what I was going to do is take the sculpture I've done myself. Mm. I've got a self-portrait sculpture reading a book. Yes, I've seen that. It's awesome. Well, I was going to put it outside Ecan with, on the book would be the correspondence between Cagle and I, which mm. he can't complain about because he said he, I could publish it. Mm. So then why would it, because the only reason he wanted the sculpture move was because of what was written on it, mm. the last one. So yep. this one, he's approved it. Mm. So why would he take it away? Mm. No. But actually... It was part of that letter I'd written to him, which is pretty heavy stuff. Oh, For example, when they took away the subsidies from farming in 1984, they put no safety nets in place and 52 farmers killed themselves. Mm -hmm. And in the letter I say, did the wives and children ring you, David Cagle, in the middle of the night and say, please help us? No. Mm -hmm. Well, he never answered that in his letter. No, of course not. But it's a heavy thing. It is. Those guys were ruthless. You know. mm -hmm. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> Let that sink in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's people we're dealing with. I think they're all sociopaths. I think, um, obviously they are. If you cannot have empathy with somebody else, if, you have, uh, if you're prepared to lie, which Cagle is. Now, example, he wrote a letter to Don Brash. You remember Don Brash? Mm -hmm. Don Brash wanted to be prime minister. Mm -hmm. You know Rod Orham, right? I've as heard a, of him. As an accountant, well, as an economist. Yeah. He's the politest, nicest man on national radio every week. Yeah. When Catherine Ryan said to him, "What do you what do you make of Don Brash? Would he make a good tr tr Would he be good, in, you know, as the um, what do you call it, Minister of Finance?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Rod's so lovely. He said, "Oh, I don't know how to put this, Catherine. Um, well, have you ever seen a dog chasing a car?" She said, "Yes." Have you ever imagined what would happen if the dog caught the car? <laughs> and that was it. That was Don Brash, right? Well, David Cagle thought Don Brash was fantastic. He wrote him a letter. It's in Nicky Hager's book, mm. an email where he said, congratulations, Don, you're just the man we need to run this country. Mm. He thought he was going to be prime minister too. Mm. 
maybe he's angling for a job with Don. <laughs> Most um, likely. And he said to him, but you've got to remember, there's a trick to leadership, uh, and it's this. On the one hand, you must keep your constituency happy, while on the other hand, never deviating from your agenda. Mm. Okay, fair enough. But what if your agenda starts to make the people unhappy? If you've got to keep the people happy, the only way to keep them happy is to lie. Mm. So what David Cagle does when I write him a letter, he writes back to me. Oh, David's engaged with me. What a nice guy. Mm. Everybody who writes to him eventually gets the letter from David in the style in which they've written to him. Mm. It's pretty cool. So did he have any humor or anything in his response to you? Or did he get to you? I thought the funniest part was the first line where he says, Sam, you write a mean letter. <laughs> <laughs> Gold. I think it's okay. We 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 met for coffee once um, when I was I was talking about Kathy and I said, look, Kathy, Kathy believes the water killed her, and uh, we had a um, scientist who set up a water lab and he tested her water and found um, all the crap in it that you get from a sheep dip. Oh now, wow! Well, because that's the big issue, isn't it? I think you top on that. This is a ticking time bomb in New Zealand. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, what, 50,000 sheep dips around. They're all time bombs. But what the government does is rather than have to deal with that problem, they exempt um, farms from being able to be termed contaminated. If you say, what, what's, oh, I don't know what the term is, but mm. if, 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 we, if we here had a problem, if we had some land here that had some crap, and well, it would have to be notified somewhere. Yeah. Um, well, they've exempted agricultural land from that, which makes wow. it easy to deal with the problem, right? Just so, ignore it, just yeah, like yeah, most just farming things. Yeah. Same that Mike's talk talks about the cadmium working party. Uh, there's so much cadmium in the ground now from superphosphate, especially up, I think, where Mike is, up in that um, part of the country. They, there's 600,000 hectares of land, and one report I read uh, was so badly contaminated with cadmium, you couldn't subdivide it, you couldn't grow vegetables. Wow. You know, you, all you could do was grow sheep and phytoremediators, which is like hemp, stuff like that, which would yeah. drag the, cad, the cadmium out of the soil. Mm. You can't get by. If you're going to put superphosphate on, no matter what, where you source it, you're going to get cadmium, and the build-up's going to increase and increase and increase. Mm. So how do you deal with it? You set up a cadmium working party, and then everybody thinks it's been dealt with. It's not. Mm. It's just a bunch of people talking about talking cadmium. Talking about it, not actually yeah. making any action, That's like it. most of these groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, going back to Kathy, so in her water, um, the one scientist we had looked at it and he found all the chemicals concomitant with uh, sheep dips. Bloody dangerous stuff, arsenic mm -hmm. levels huge. ECAN then came down, they sent Hills Laboratory, a different uh, laboratory in Christchurch, to look at it. They found nothing there. The first scientist says, well, the reason they found nothing, and this, this is hearsay, so I, I've got to say this, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't talked to Hills. Mm -hmm. He believed, and he might be wrong, that they were measuring the water and not sediment, and that uh, arsenic uh, bonds to sediment, that if you filter the water and then test it, you won't find the arsenic. Okay. That was his view, Now I don't know if that's correct or not. Mm. So that was debatable, and that's the reason I met with Cagle at this cafe and talked about it. I said, well, I want to talk, talk about Kathy. So he said, yeah, we'll, we'll meet. And he said, well, it's arguable whether the arsenic was in her water or not, and that's true, it is arguable because we just haven't got any you know, firm base on that. Mm. But at the beginning, the reason I want to talk about that was at the beginning of that meeting with Cagle, because we were there to confront each other in a way, I just, the first two-thirds of the conversation, the interview, we were just laughing, and I kept it as light as possible and mm. kept the hard questions to the end. Mm. And you probably know this too with your interviews. Um, if you go straight into the beginning, defences will go up. For sure. So when you asked if he has a sense of humour, he does. Mm. And we did, we laughed well, and there were good belly laughs. And I thought, this man I would like to know in another life, mm. in another context. Mm. The same with Nick Smith, the same with Muldoon. If you found them somewhere else, the chances are you'd find something to like. Mm. But the fact that you can, you could, he could talk with Kathy and not be turned around by her, mm. or not be moved by her, Makes me think that yeah, he 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 at base is doesn't have empathy, and that's mm. the definition of sociopathy, I think. Mm. To be intelligent but not have empathy, mm. um, to be able to lie, and to be able to create um, what do you call it um, justifications for lying, if you like. Mm. And they'll all say it's for the public good in the end. Mm. 
this is Edward Bernays, that guy, the, the guy that invented public relations. He said, we are the secret government. We are the invisible government. We create perceptions. Of, we create the people's wants and needs and their perceptions. We, we create that for them. They think they want a brand new SUV. No, mm. no, no. We make them, we make them to, yeah, yes, yeah. Every marketing campaign that's existed. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, Sam, tell us, um, so you've got the, the Nick Smith. Um, when do you think that's going to be? Well, I want to drag it out until August. Okay. And then we'll slowly make our way up to um, Parliament, yep. uh, take the long route. Yep, of course. I was talking to someone the other day, so why don't we get Mike Joy to sail his boat? Ah, that's where he's going to sailing, isn't he? Yeah. Well, he can sail to Picton, and then we yep. could tow Nick Smith, who's very floatable, yep. across to Seatoon, and we could beach him there. <laughs> And they get a whole bunch of young greenies there with buckets of water, refusing to refloat them. <laughs> Just wouldn't leave them cool? beach. That yeah. would be cool. I could even make some very realistic flies to put on them. Yeah. But no. Um, so we'll get them over to Parliament and we'll put them on the front lawn, have a bit of a ceremony. Cool. And get Mike Joy there. Maybe yeah. Brian Turner can come up. I asked yeah. Brian Turner. Uh, he's a poet, used to be poet laureate of the country. Yeah. Lovely man. He's been fighting water down south. Get him to come with me and do a road trip together. Mm -hmm. And we could do a few poems, go to the Souter Art Gallery, maybe have an evening there. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, leave Nick Smith outside, which is good. Yep. Um, and just generally make, have fun. And possibly have another car following full of um, rocket launchers and shotguns <laughs> and, and AK-47s. When the, when the death threats start coming through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we could just have a lot of fun with this, I think. Yeah. That's, that's the key, is it? Is yeah, it's got to be. People re, um, react to that really well. There's the humour in it. And yep. even though there's that, that deep message there that our water is being destroyed, yeah. you've got to have that humour to be able to connect with people. And There's once... I did a caricature sculpture of Alec Neal, who was once chair of ECAN. And Alec, again, was one of these guys. I could... You know, we, we were speaking at a meeting together once, an art opening, actually. Hmm. And he said, oh, I, see, I, see, I see Sam Mann is here. He's going to be speaking. We, we have a love-hate relationship. And I thought, what, what love part was it? I can't remember that. <laughs> I only saw the hate. So I did this um, caricature of him out of fiberglass. It was sort of half life-size portrait of him. Yep. Huge head, small body. Wearing a suit, but sticking out of his fly was a um, tap. You know, a brass. Yeah. You know, that you could, right, a water tap. Yep. It looked great. Yeah. Um, and we put this on a huge big billboard uh, on Montreal Street. And when I just put it up, I was behind the hedge just ramming some stakes into hot in position because you know, a car pulled up on the road and some kids got out to go to the art centre. And this one kid said, oh, look, mummy, that man has a, has a tap for his penis. And <laughs> it's dripping. <laughs> and just, the laughs were great. Yeah. In fact, the best part, in the end, we mounted it on the back of my Morris Minor and drove it around town. Awesome. We parked outside the Rickerton Market at one stage, and a friend of mine was driving, and she had the flu, and she was feeling miserable, and she went to sleep behind the wheel, just sitting there while it was parked. And then suddenly, she thought she was having an earthquake because the whole Mori was rocking. And she jumped out, and standing on the back was Alec Neal himself, with his arm around his own sculpture, having his wife take a photograph. Yeah. So, so uh, Leslie Amazing. took a photograph too, and it was on page one of the press the next day. Awesome. Great. And that was it. Um, and he... he um, when you do something that you know the public are enjoying, the politicians usually come inside mm. and try to defuse it by yeah. laughing as well. Yeah, exactly. That's Otherwise, they, they stand out as being, yeah. you know, no sense of humour. Or... But I don't know, don't know how Nick's going to make fun out of this one. Yeah. So yeah. you are saying, I was talking to you before, about the different things. You've got a few options there, and whether you want to have his testicle showing yeah. or... Uh... Well, it's a very ser serious issue, this, um, because for some reason we think that uh, testicles make a man. You know? Yeah. Clothes make a man? No, yeah. testicles make a man. <laughs> And um, so we don't know whether to do a Ken Barbie doll and have a blank, mm. uh, or we have tiny nuts like walnuts, or we have the you know the breadfruit swinging in the wind, yeah. um, and maybe a thermostatic uh, penis that comes and goes with the whether it's cold or hot. Um, some said we should have you know when you buy a grinding set of tools you have. Yeah. Things that go with them, accessories. Mm -hmm. Some said maybe put a gerbil in there with the face <laughs> of John Key. Um, it's, I think we need to go to the web and ask people, but yeah, someone said totally. to me the other day, instead of testicles, put on a pair of udders. Yes. Okay. That would be powerful. So I need a response. I need people yeah. to help me out with this one. Okay, so. well, we can definitely put that out there can and you? just see what people think. Thank we you. get a poll going. and um, Thank you, Kyle. Because then and then that will raise a lot of awareness about the trip going up. And um, Well, how about this? If, if, with, with the people have been making donations, I thought <clears throat> they could all go into a draw Whoever wins the competition gets their name engraved on his left buttock. <laughs> and a big tattoo. 
Is that okay? Or is that, is that... I think that'd be fine. Yeah, it's not, totally. It's not trivializing yeah. it in some way. No, no, not at all. Okay. I think it's a, it'd be quite a quite a fun thing to do. Okay. So if anyone who does um, want to participate, how much is that? It's going to cost about twelve thousand. Was it for the? I put that up as a number, but I'll do it for nothing. You know, yeah, 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 of course. We, but... What I wanted was for people to buy into it, really. Yeah. And and the don- donations have come in quite. So we've got a, an, we've got enough money to make, it, which is good. Okay. Anything more we get is great, which makes it easier for us. And sure. all I was asking people for was. For uh, the price of a, of a Ponce de Cappuccino. Yeah, which but, isn't much at all. No, yeah. but somebody said the other, they sent $100 in the other day and said, uh, thanks, I, I want to be doing something, but I yeah. can't, so this is the best we can do. Totally. Um, I think a lot of, lot of people will respond the same way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, if you guys, I'll leave um, in the notes of this podcast, I'll leave some bank details in there if you guys want to contribute, because I think this is really powerful activism, using art as, um, as such a, a thing to, yeah, create mm. debate and discussion and... I'm really looking forward to um, to seeing Nick Smith's response to this. This is going to be amazing. Well, thanks, Carl. Thank you very much. And, yeah, so thanks. Thanks for thinking wind up there, cool. Sam. Awesome to talk to you, mate. I think people are really going to enjoy responding to this and this thing. Can I please have my cappuccino now? You can have your cappuccino now. <laughs> Christ.